welcome. I'm so glad you're joining us today. Our prayer is that this service will help you take your next step in your walk with Jesus. We like to say our church is like a family, but we're a family that can't get together in person right now, but we still want to serve each other. So if there's any way that we can help you or, or pray for you, please let us know. You can stay connected throughout the week on our Facebook page and make sure you're signed up to get prayer requests and other updates by text through our Remind text messaging. If you missed any of our services, you can catch up. Just go to our website, firstpresbinecity.org, and there are links to each week's message or service. There's also opportunities to give there, and I want to thank those who have been so faithful in supporting the ministries of our church through your tithes and offerings. Many of you have been mailing your gifts, and we certainly appreciate that. If you'd like to give online, you can do that as well. Just go to our website, click on the appropriate button. Well, this week's Christmas, and we will be having a Christmas Eve service, which is an opportunity for us to gather in person. We'll actually be having two different services this year, one at 4 o'clock and one at 5.30. And we just ask that you would let us know if you're able to come and which service you would plan to attend so that we could be sure there's enough room for everyone given the current capacity limits due to COVID. Well, we're going to begin today with our Advent candle celebration. And to uh, start us out with that, here's Jordan Spar. This is the fourth week we are celebrating Advent. Advent is a time of preparation. During these days, we are getting our hearts ready for the coming of the Christ child. Today's candle is the candle of peace. During Advent, we pray that we, as well as all people, will seek God's peace. When we look at the fourth candle, we remember what the angels told the shepherds. Luke says, Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. Jesus' coming was prophesied by Isaiah 9-6, who wrote, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for sending your Son, Jesus. Thank you for those in our world today who seek to act for peace. Help us look for ways to be peacemakers at home, at church, at work, and at school. Amen. Don't worry, my boy. You'll be nice and warm. I wrapped you in your mother's old blanket. <laughs> Some start we've had, huh? A 90 mile walk, just so you could get born in a stable. You know, if we were back home in Nazareth, oh, I could build you a fine crib. But here, no crib. I have to put you to sleep in the hay. visit from an angel mm -hmm. and to write it down so I wouldn't forget what it said Joseph son of David fear not to take Mary for your wife for what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit she will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus he will save the people from their sins. Did you hear that? You will save us from our sins. You will be, you are the Messiah. And I've been chosen to be the Messiah's Papa. I do not know how it will happen, but I'm, 
I'm done doubting. I want to tell you how happy that you make me. No, it's more than happiness. It's what did the shepherds say the angels told them? They, they bring good news, great joy. Yes, that's what it is. It's joy. That's what you bring. My sweet, beautiful boy. You bring me so, so much joy. Well, we're coming up on Christmas in just a few days, and I got a question for you. At this point in the season, anybody feeling a, a little bit stressed? You know, it's funny because this is the season where we talk about peace on earth and, and silent night and so on, but this tends to be kind of a stressful time of year. And this year may be more than most with COVID fears and lockdowns and isolation and so on. So what I want to do today for a few minutes is just think with you about a kind of stress associated with the very first Christmas. And this was first pointed out to me by uh, John Ortberg in a message of his, and I'm indebted to both him and to New Testament scholar Scott McKnight for uh, a lot of the material that we're going to be looking at. The passage uh, I want to take a look at this morning is in Matthew chapter 1, if you want to follow along. If you're watching this on video, this will be on the screen. But I want you to think back for a moment to the very first Christmas. It was kind of a stressful time for, for Mary and Joseph in a lot of ways. For one thing, they were coming up on a wedding, and, and weddings are always stressful times, especially for brides. I was amazed to find out the number of magazines that are published aimed at stressed out brides. There are magazines called Bride, Modern Bride, Today's Bride, Elegant Bride, Rock and Roll Bride, Minnesota Bride, New Jersey Bride, pretty much every state. Uh, there's another one called, called Bride Again Magazine for the Encore Bride. There's all these bride magazines. You know what you don't see a lot of? You rarely see a magazine like Modern Groom because nobody really cares what the groom looks like at a wedding. You know, nobody walks away from a wedding saying, oh, didn't he look radiant? At a wedding, a groom is basically a prop. It's kind of like a, a restroom in an art gallery. You have to have one, but nobody goes there to see one. Well, today I want to think with you about the kind of stress that was on the life of this groom, Joseph, because he paid a price for what happened at Christmas that you probably never thought about before. And in a beautiful way, it foreshadows what God was doing, what Jesus would sacrifice, and what Christmas love is all about. 
The passage from Matthew 1 is a story that might fit under the category, the scandal of love. It says this, verse 18. This is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother, Mary, was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins." All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. I want to start with a single word because it's the hinge of this whole message. When Matthew says in verse 19 that Joseph was faithful to the law, that phrase was actually a technical expression. Sometimes gets translated as a righteous man. In Hebrew, it was a single word, the word sadiq. What this means is that Joseph was known for his uncompromising obedience to Torah, the, the book of the law. Whatever it said, he did. He didn't eat unclean foods, didn't mix with the wrong kind of people, didn't keep the carpentry shop open on Sabbath to try to make a few extra shekels. He was a sadiq. That's who he was. And everybody in his little village knew this about him. Nobody invited Joseph over to have ham sandwiches with tax collectors and prostitutes because he was what people wanted to be in that culture. An Israelite wanted to be a sadiq because then they would be looked up to and admired and respected. And that's what Joseph was. But he was a sadiq with a problem because he was engaged, his fiancée was pregnant, and he wasn't the father. Put yourself in his place for a moment. Your fiancée is pregnant, and your whole reputation and identity revolve around one thing, your commitment to Torah. What Torah says you do, that's, that's who you are. Torah has some very clear instructions about what to do in, to somebody in Mary's condition. There's a section in Deuteronomy 22 that covers marriage violation. Think about what it said. She shall be brought to the door of her father's house, and there the men of her town shall stone her to death. She has done an outrageous thing in Israel by being promiscuous while still in her father's house. You must purge the evil from among you. Now, Joseph knew Torah. Maybe he would have thought that uh, she had been seduced by another man, and in which case, according to Torah, they were both to be stoned. Torah was painfully clear, and Joseph's whole understanding of righteousness, his reputation and identity as a sadiq, were on the line. Everybody in the village assumed they knew what he was going to do. All, his, all of his fellow sadikim would have reminded him that this sin must be publicly exposed and punished. And here's where the story takes a strange turn. Literally, the text says, being a righteous man, he wanted to avoid scandal. Being a, a sadiq, he wanted to avoid a scandal. Now, it's a little tricky to translate, and people often think of it as, well, because he was righteous. But a New Testament scholar by the name of Don Hagner says the best translation of the passage is probably this. Although he was a righteous man, he wanted to avoid a scandal. In spite of the fact that he was a sadiq, and in spite of the fact that he was righteous, he didn't want a scandal. See, there's a tension going on in this story. Under the old system, righteousness would have demanded that Mary be exposed. Sinners needed to be excluded. Standards have to be maintained. Under the old system, the righteous had to separate themselves from sin and sinners. Righteous men would not have hesitated. But Joseph hesitated. He couldn't bring himself to say the words. He couldn't bring himself to go public, even though he was a sadiq, a, a righteous man. Joseph must have agonized over this day after day. By the time the angel comes to him, Joseph has struggled with this for some time. We don't know how long. But Joseph already knows that Mary is pregnant. How did Joseph find out? 
Well, Mary must have told him. I mean, just think about that conversation. Take a guess for a minute. How old Mary was at this time? Well, the general consensus among New Testament scholars is that Mary would have been about 13 years old. So picture this conversation and put yourself in Joseph's place. You're engaged and your fiance is a 13-year-old girl. She comes to you one day and says, Well, Joseph, I've got some bad news and some good news. The bad news is that I'm pregnant even though we're not married yet. The good news is I haven't been unfaithful to you. I haven't been with anybody. An angel came to me. Remember, this is a 13-year-old girl in an obscure village in the middle of nowhere. An angel came to me and said, Hail Mary, full of grace. You have found favor with God, and you're going to have a miracle baby conceived by the Holy Spirit, and all generations will call you blessed, except Protestants. And the last second desperation pass at a football game with time running out is going to be named after you. Well, that's a pretty wild story. And she didn't even have midi chlorians to blame. I mean, I mean, can you imagine Joseph's response? Like, seriously? An angel appears to you? A 13-year-old girl in an unimportant, obscure village in the middle of nowhere? An angel? I mean, this had to be a huge struggle for him. Eventually, he decides to divorce her. And betrothal in that day was a legal step and required something like divorce to be ended. The text says he decides to divorce her, but quietly. And in that way, maybe he could minimize her suffering, but still maintain his status as a sadiq. Can you feel the tension, uh, the battle between his desire to be compassionate on one hand and his understanding of what it meant to be righteous on the other? And then in verse 20, God sends a message to Joseph. See if you can figure out what the key word is in this verse. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. What's the key word? I think it's after. See, here's the question. Why did God make Joseph wait until after he had to think and struggle with all this stuff? Why couldn't an angel just come to him ahead of time and explain everything that was going to happen and, and just remove all that anxiety? Is it possible that anxiety removal is not God's number one goal for Joseph? Or maybe for you and me? Is it possible that in getting his world turned upside down, and in having to struggle between what he thought a sadiq, a righteous man, ought to do, and his longing to show compassion to this girl, that maybe Joseph was being prepared by God to come to a whole new understanding of what righteousness really is? Is it possible that God allowed this disequilibrium to take place in Joseph's life so that he'll come to a whole new level of growth? Is it possible in your life, maybe right now, if you're confused or disoriented or uncertain about something, that maybe you're about to grow. Maybe what you need to do is just wait on God and keep trusting and, and praying and refuse to violate God's work. Trust that God is going to do something in your life you don't even know about yet. That's what happens here. The angel says, Joseph, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife. Now, why would Joseph be afraid to wed Mary? Where does fear come into the picture? Well, Joseph would be afraid of offending God. He'd be afraid of, of disobeying Torah. But I think it's more than that. Joseph would be afraid of losing his reputation. Joseph would be afraid of what everybody would think of him. Joseph would be afraid that the status it had taken him a lifetime to build up would be destroyed. Joseph knew about his own doubts when Mary came to him and told him about the angel. Again, by the time we read the story, he knows she's pregnant, but he's deciding to divorce her quietly. So he must have doubted. Like, there's no way people in this town are going to believe that an angel came to a poor couple in an obscure village and impregnated a virgin teenage girl. They're going to think that's a joke. They're going to think what people always think when a pregnant girl gets married. If Joseph married this girl, his friends would never accept his account of what happened. He would never be invited to the homes of the other righteous again. He would never be given their business again. He would suffer financially. He'd be shunned. He'd be committing social suicide. 
He would never again be admired or respected as a lover of Torah. If he committed himself to this baby, the, the one that would be known as Jesus, and his mom, he would do so at an enormous sacrifice. His whole reputation, the work of a lifetime, would be trashed. That's what he's facing. And then in verses 24 and 25, Joseph does two things. First, he takes Mary home. That was a legal step. In that day, it meant Joseph completed the wedding ceremony and publicly claimed her as his wife. That's what it means when it says he takes her home. And then the text says that Joseph names the baby. He names the baby. This too is a legal action. He is publicly claiming, adopting this child as his own. He takes Mary home and he gives the baby a name. Legally, Joseph has now deliberately tied his destiny to the lives of two stained, tra trashed reputations. He has made a decision that will awe anyone who understands it. He did the one thing that a Sadiq never did. His days as a Sadiq are over. Whatever the future holds for him, it will not be polite respectability. Not ever again. I want to show you how fully Joseph bets the farm on what God's doing. Jesus was a part of a larger family. How many brothers and sisters do you think Jesus had? Take a guess. And what were their names? Now, if you're watching or listening to, uh, to this with someone else, just tell them your guess. How many brothers and sisters do you think Jesus had? And what were their names? Well, we're told in a section in Mark chapter 6, verse 3, that he had four brothers, and their names were James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon. And his sisters were named Heather and Brittany. I just made that last part up. We don't know his sisters' names. And it's a little hard to tell from the English translation because these are the Greek versions of their names. But in Hebrew, they would have been names for Israel's famous patriarchs, Jacob, Joseph, Judah, and Simeon. And scholars think it may well be that Joseph and Mary gave their sons these names because they believed that through their son Jesus, God was going to once again renew his people. That God at last, through their son, was going to fulfill his dream of the creation of a redeemed community. That's what God's up to in the birth of this little baby. And it may be here in Mark 6, 3, that we see part of the price that Joseph paid. This is an interesting scene set back in Jesus' hometown where the people are expressing skepticism. They don't think much about Jesus, his claims, or his miracles. And their comment about him is this. Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son? Now, in that culture, no one would refer to a man in that way. A man would be referred to as the son of his father. So even though Joseph might have been dead by then, Jesus, Jesus would have been known as Jesus, Joseph's son. The son of Joseph, Jesus bar Joseph. But they didn't do that. To refer to a man as the son only of the mother could be a real harsh expression. Something like the English phrase when somebody calls someone else the, the son of a, and then uses a crude, insulting word for the mother. Mark 6.3 may reflect the fact that decades later, in their little village, Joseph's reputation still has not recovered from his marriage. And only Mary and Jesus knew why Joseph did what he did. That's the scandal of love. This week, it's been amazing for me to think about how after Joseph died, in the decades and centuries and millennia to follow, millions of people would make sacrifices for the sake of this one called Jesus. Many would give up their status, their possessions, their convenience, many their freedom, many their lives. Joseph would give up his identity and his reputation for Jesus. And Joseph had not even seen him yet. Maybe God decided that Jesus, who would later be called a friend of sinners, should be raised in a family that knew firsthand what it felt like to be regarded in the spiritually second-class category. That's how it was for Jesus growing up. There were whispers about him, his mom, while he was growing up. Maybe Part of why Jesus had such a heart for respect, unrespectable people is that he was raised in a family by a father who had sacrificed his responsibility for his son. 
Maybe one reason that Jesus had so much compassion for women who were walking scandals is that he knew what it meant to his mom, that his father had stuck by her when she was signal, single and pregnant, and when all the righteous folks would have said, take a walk. I think of how Jesus, as he was growing up, must have had admired his dad's courage so much. I was thinking this week, what if our church became known all over Pine City for the scandal of love? What if word started to spread that no matter what you've done or how badly you've messed up, this is a community where they won't stone you? What if what happened in Jesus' day happened again here? What if word started to spread that there's a place where you just get loved? Let me ask you a little more personal question. Who is God calling you to love? Where is God inviting you into the scandal of love? Jesus said that one characteristic of, of his kind of love is that it gets extended to people who are difficult to love. Jesus said one time, if you just love people who are easy to love, like people who will love you back, well, anybody does that. Like Babies do that. Terrorists do that. One of the most important things you need for Chris, Christmas, if you want to grow spiritually, is a difficult person in your life. Do you have a difficult person in your life? If you don't, our church has a list. We can assign you one. I mentioned this because there's a good chance that over the next few days, you're going to be sitting around a table somewhere celebrating Christmas, and there's going to be a difficult person sitting with you. And if you want to, you, you can cross your arms. You can pick up a stone. A lot of people do that. Sadly, a lot of churches have a lot of stone throwers. You can pass judgment if you want to. For whatever reason, like, this person doesn't measure up to my standards. Or they're too odd or too bad or too off, too wrong, or too loud, or, or too something. They, they don't see things the way I do about politics or, or faith or the pandemic. So you can sit back and pass judgment if you want. Or you can hear God's invitation into the scandal of love and remember the love that came your way and then pass it along. God's all about the scandal of love. And Jesus grew up embracing the scandal Loving people that, that nobody else, let alone a Sadiq, would love. And people looked at Jesus and said, You think you're a righteous man? You call yourself a Sadiq? You're a friend of sinners. You're embracing people no Sadiq ever would. But Jesus came to teach about another kind of righteousness, a, a better kind of righteousness. You start to see so many parts of Jesus' life in a different light when you think about this story. There was a time Jesus was teaching, and he said, For I tell you that unless your righteousness, your, your sadiqness, surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. And people wondered, like, what kind of righteousness is he talking about? And Jesus must have been thinking inside, I've seen a better kind of righteousness firsthand. My father was a man like that. Maybe God had a reason for this odd, painful, lonely way to start a family. Maybe God still calls people to be willing to die to reputation and status and comfort for the sake of love. Anybody who wants to be can be part of that righteousness because God, in a manger, in a stable, was starting a new kind of community this new kind of sadiqness that is available to us. Not because we work so hard to impress other people with how good and spiritual we are, but by faith, as a gift that Jesus gives. It's given to anybody who kneels at the manger and says of Jesus what Joseph said. I'm with him. I'm with him. I, I cast my lot with him. I tie my life to him. That's why we exist as a body of believers. That's why we seek to extend this kingdom that was launched by that little child. When Joseph made the decision to wed Mary, he thought it was the end of his reputation as a righteous man. He did not fully know 
that the child he would adopt would bring a new kind of righteousness to the human race. That's what we celebrate at Christmas. That's the scandal of love. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for your son, Jesus. And we thank you for the new kind of righteousness that he displayed, that he lived out, that he saw modeled in a way, in his own earthly father, and that he models for us. Lord, I pray that we would be people who would extend grace, extend love, that that we would be part of this scandal of love in the days ahead and in the weeks ahead. Lord, when those difficult people come across our path, I pray that we would not be ones to throw stones, but that we would be the first to walk across the room to extend grace and love and compassion, your grace, your love. Lord, thank you for this. Thank you for this message and this example that we can look back on, on Joseph's life. And Lord, I just pray now that you would give us wisdom to know what to do with what we've just heard and the courage to do it. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen.